Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I was um I was raised in the of India and I moved here in my early twenties, first to New York and then to Philadelphia. And um, long story why I dance, that will take up too much time, but that I moved around 2004 and I started dancing. I established my nonprofit in 2008, but I started dancing like right away. I don't remember ever not dancing, not professionally, but out of many things, like out of boredom, frustration, sadness, everything led to dancing. Um, but since we have the fortune of the audio working, maybe we should go back. Let's all pretend this never happened. So the flow of the event was, yeah, we are, we can travel in time. The flow of the event was now introducing me and then this did not happen. And then lo and behold, let's jump to this moment. Ekonka Satna Karta Purak Nirpo Nirver Akal Murat Ajuni Jappa Chuppe chupp na ho vai Je lai raha levtaar Pukhya pukh na utri Je banna purya paar Sahasyan palak hoi Ta ik na challe na you said you sure I just wanted to see the center. I wasn't exactly sure I was going to go for a certain exhibit. But I walked in and obviously the first thing that caught my eye was the scale of the web right here. I walked past that and I stood here. I was transfixed. I did not take my eyes off. Now mind you I'm a dancer. I wouldn't call myself having any extraordinary knowledge in sculpture. <laughs> um so there's so many things that First was just the images, like, okay, there's a man in a five faucet, and look at the neatness, just the cleanness of the installation. And um, Katie, if we can turn this on, I'll tell you why this struck me, that just the fact that this is a sculpture, um, there must be a... Uh, Thank you for waiting. But I grew up in India and um, in South Asia in jungle, when you speak of culture, when you look at our ancient, very ancient traditions of culture, 
this is a person that comes to mind. Not just comes to mind, this is everywhere. In temples and in museums. And um, our place, obviously, Stone Culture is a, is a big heritage in South Asia. I saw this until I saw this and I went home and there's something, you know, something when that sticks to you but your frontal lobe can't quite make sense of it but your, your, your hind brain makes sense and it means something else. And then it came to me that yes, always culture meant this or something like this. Um, it's interesting even though I can't, I don't know for a fact, thousands of years back in time but something tells me this is a male gaze. <laughs> And so when we serve, we have a very rich heritage of culture, but most of them either are about very voluptuous, beautifully, perfectly symmetrical women or elements of nature. It is striking to me that Mara Abe is a woman, um, when she takes her tools and when she decides to serve something, this is what she does, is like make a very bold statement. And that's where um, first thing is like, this is something, taps, you can like simple taps, process, but it's in a very clear reference there because bottom, this is usually for the process of the do. It's an ablution process outside box, traditionally, that you cleanse yourself um, outside a mosque before you enter. So that struck me because again, um, Katie, if you have Light all Gurdwara. I am of part Sikh and part Hindu heritage from my parents. So this struck me that how in a Sikh place of worship, a Sikh temple, which is called a Gurdwara, this is what we do. Originally, they used to have giant pools of water where you would, you would expect to take a full head to go back, obviously for for um, lack of space and time. <laughs> now this is what you have. You have like a pool of water. Here. Somehow, this mechanism of cleansing is very important, but physical cleansing only that struck out to me um, because it doesn't guarantee or it doesn't even lure you actually to work on cleansing of the inside, which all religions want us to. And that's where again, Humera struck me that she now goes inside the mosque, um, and this is what. Two windows in what is a very traditional Arabic um, fashion. And um, this is our beautiful painting. She painted this on what is called a Wasri paper. And pretty obviously, without um, any signage, I can tell that when we enter a mosque, it's the figure of an imam or a cleric. Again, looking at you fully front, directly in your eyes. First, and when his back is to us, that's when, like, well, now we are looking at our gaze directly. I don't know if you can see, but again, um, I love the boldness and appreciate the courage of Mera that she does not even mince her metaphors. Who knows what the cleric is holding behind her hand? She has painted a cover of the Playboy magazine, uh, which is very telling. Um, again, which can it all? if you can have the um, first slide and again that didn't strike me immediately but it came to me later that she is painting in the style of the miniature painting um, of the figures painting with Persian Angra and they are all they have big overlap. But one thing again that common in all of them that signature is that you can see here the subject in the paintings are always painted and there are like don't even know if they're in river paintings like this many times. And they are such commonplace things, not the original paintings, but the, the replicas of them in South Asian culture that you see them on tapestries and you see them on trays serving food. It's everywhere, it's ubiquitous. But what again to the layperson is not immediately noticeable is the subjects are always in the profile. Or at the most that we work on. It's like we are observing them, but we are not quite making a direct dialogue with them. Here she's turning the norm on its head. That the subject, there is nothing else. There is, as you see, there is no animals or birds in the background to dilute the effect. Um, it's only the person that she is like, just look at him and see 
what he represents. And he is making full frontal contact. And it's pretty obvious that it's like I'm watching you cleanse yourself here as I do this. But when he turns around, it's a first question that did we actually cleanse ourselves and how cleansed are you inside? You're hiding from me. Very striking description. That's why I chose to talk about that this is something and this is not about Sumera happens to be a Muslim and obviously this is Islamic tradition. Um, that we are talking about, but this is something um, I can talk about, and I bet you can talk about all religious power bearers, not the religion itself. It's all religions, whichever they are, once we can agree on is virtuosity, state is full, don't have double standards, is something they all want us to follow over and over and over and over again. Um, power bearers have tweaked that, as we know that. The AV system wants us to know that we are in the light in here. So hard. <laughs> Speakers are very important persons in our lives, and I can really vouch for that as a dancer. But every performance, speakers, some part of the AV system has to affirm that I'm here, I'm alive, and if you thought, I would be watching for you. So, yeah, that was again very, that's very telling in this. That struck to me is that we are questioning. How do we let power bearers enjoy us? Almost, I feel like we are compliant. It's not always a simple choice, but we are compliant, and it has been like that for centuries. And I don't know if you feel like the fact that it's still that way, like now as we live, that what happens or what gets done in the name of religion or with religion as a trope, and what it was actually meant for, makes us do things we don't want to do. And we Keep watching for it, and we also keep voting for it uh, based on that. We keep making big and small life choices based on that. And how, how are we going to prove that? How do you want that, that disrupt our everyday thinking and start a movement once within ourselves and then for a bigger, make it a bigger mass collective? Is what I, what I saw in this. So for that, this was very, very again, it stood out. And uh, I had the wonderful honor to speak with the artist, Mera. She lives in Seattle, but we have been communicating over email and video calls. And, um, I asked her, and like, um, and I was very candid with her, and I hope she also um, she reciprocated in the same manner. I'm like, Mera, I'm going to do this big honor that I'm talking on this, but is there anything utterly inappropriate I could say about your subject? Let's begin there. Would you like me to not say something? And she's like. Absolutely not, but I do want you to say what I want you to say to this subject. That why is it taboo for us to talk about what religion in general all over the world makes us feel like why is that so taboo? What happens in the spaces? Why is that taboo? And that also brings to me this beautiful compiled book. Um I don't know um how I think of it the for sale or is is this I highly recommend that. That also opens eyes a lot for their work or that book, where the Nova interviews Mera about her process, her conclusion, and all that. And so she talks about this that how everything in life that is super critical to us somehow a tab. That's very counterintuitive. That what we want to talk about are the issues that are bothering us. Um, are the let's not talk about that. And it struck a parallel to me because the dance. Style that I do, that um, now I talk about Bhatanatyam. It's Persian paintings and everything comes from the South Asian continent. The style of Bharatanatyam goes back to 5,000 years. In counting. And before that, I really wonder if we can even put that date because we have no way to measure what was happening before 2000. But in the southern part of India, the Meridian Indian states, as we call them, and of course, that's what contact has expanded over centuries. That's the South Asia, where this dance style Bharatanatyam originated. And as you see me, like I can't even help it, because my culture is coming out through me that the dance style was vocabularized and modified from what people and how people express themselves. So, these, for example, 
number if I just hand gestures. This is what I'm trying to tell you. Or this is what my gesture means. So Bharatanatyam came from folks, from people, how they move their bodies. And if they set the movement of their bodies, their poetry, their philosophy to music and rhythm, that's how the dance style became a dance style. But today it's one of the second dance styles of India. One of the first ones, one of the oldest one, and one that is the most traveled, most popular, that I can say unequivocally. I don't have data because it's there are a lot of South Asians in the world, as you might all know, population is something where we are winning. So every sixth person in the world probably knows the word, word Bharatanatyam. So you would think that anything about that dance from anything that's expressed through it is not taboo, it's just the opposite. With Indian culture in general to have little children, especially girls, just like you have in ballet, right from the time they're five or six, go take Bharatanatyam lessons, very common, including here in North America. There are Bharatanatyam classes, dance schools, they are so pervasive in the United States, you'd be surprised. People are running it out of their basement studio. Do you think that this is something that is that is allowing us to give a language where you can talk about things? That is just the opposite. The traditional repertoire of the dance is very limited, in my opinion, and this is my very personal opinion, which drives my work to themes of worship very specifically to Hindu themes of worship. This may be water here. Um, and a very detailed codified repertoire that you would learn over the seven years of your education as you learn Bharatanatyam. And if you choose to practice it, perform it, which is great, it's beautiful, it's very nuanced, it's very complex, and in and by itself, it is so much to see and partake in. But people like me and many people like, many other people like me are questioning that if we have this really powerful language that has sustained itself over centuries, why are we hesitant to talk about other things to it? And the minute you do, um, Folks that you never knew existed or who never cared about how arts are presented, they become gatekeepers because they're afraid that, oh my God, what might you say through it? So as long as it comes back to the male gaze of the female sculpture, that as long as you are doing mostly devotional, traditional repertoire, which is always about, almost always about the female waiting for the male, the God to appear in front of her and appease her. If you um, divert from that, you are diluting the art form. So people like me are, uh, very often we have to fix everything by saying this is contemporization, this is contemporary, all the things we are talking about have been eternal. What is contemporary today has always been there before and after. So that's also something that I see very similar in my dance form, the way um, I make my work and my dancers work with me and the way Humaira is approaching her art and her artistic vision and statement. So. Mudras, for instance, hand gestures are a very integral part of my dance. For example, this is, you can, you'll be surprised how you can do it. Do you want to uh, humor yourself? Test the flexibility of your fingers. Nobody loses. This is a competition that everybody wins. So let's do this. Whichever hand you're comfortable with, if you're right-handed, most of the time it's your right hand. That gives you the most ease of movement because your palm up. Let's ensure that all your fingers are held together and your thumb is tucked in. Now let's bend from here, these two fingers. You can do it, great, you just did it. And now these two, your forefinger and the middle finger, split it like you're breaking something apart. It looks like this here, this here, just from this angle. You can hold it. Now his two points for trying and succeeding so well. So this is a designated, by designate I mean mudra. Mudra hand gestures are alphabets. We have about 27 of them. They go in only a certain um, order, just like ABC do. So this, in its Sanskrit and Tamil uh, linguistic origins, is called the Kartari Hasta. 
cutlery literally means scissors as you see here. So now the applied meaning of this is what it was meant to be is how often do we dance about scissors or it they show up as a as a theme in our dance almost never. Thank God, right? I mean, which can you talk about scissors in your dance form? But this is where the applicability comes in. So scissors are just an alphabet. Let's call it D. So you can make dog with D. You can make dilemma with D. And if it's in the middle of the world, it's escaped. It's the end. So D regard. You make the words, you make the haikus about how you place it. So, kartari hasta is sometimes my thoughts wander away. Or, I was braiding my hair this morning while I was thinking, did I pay my bills? Eco was overdue already. Or, this one you all will relate with. Just guess what I'm doing. Driving my car. You've done this. You know when have you done this? When someone just cuts out from the next lane right in front of you and you give them this. So this is <laughs> this is the angry third eye that you didn't know that existed. <laughs> so the next time you are somebody acts out when you're driving, you're like, I'm just practicing an ancient art form. <laughs> and you give them the look. So this was, this is how we used hand gestures. So they are used, they are applied to convey meaning. And the meaning can be abstract, sometimes can be very direct. And sometimes we use it just to make small um, steps in our dance. And when we did this, it was purely for ornamentation purpose. So now I'm going to what I started my presentation with. It was a very small verse, which is called the, or literally the verse which is from the Guru Granth Sahib. The Guru Granth Sahib is a sacred um, scripture and text in the Sikh culture. And it talks about this, that verse roughly translates into that what Guru Nanak, the founding guru of the Guru Granth Sahib said, just as I have not read the Quran, but I'm guessing the founding principles wanted us to learn that God is whatever you want them to be. God can also be not a them, it can be a it. I mean, none of that, it can be simply an entity. It's something that does not begin, it's not end, unless it's eternal and it crosses and it transcends time and space. Because ultimately, it's about your subconscious that is your God. And that's what we began in this gesture that you cannot actually think God. That this is what you could, if that's what you want to do, you want. A picture of a goddess, and that is what makes you meditate. Please do that, but do not limit yourself from that one interpretation of God, because God is limited only by your imagination. Um, you will see God not by praying in places of worship, but like we did this, that when somebody is starving, and if you think you can help them alleviate that, that's when you have God has acted through. And I ended it by saying that this is what gods have always calligraphed or written for us to do. This can be the opening of the Guru Granth Sahib of any script at um, Holi. Many of whom we have not even seen, but we can guess that that's what they all asked us. As is this opening of your hands in Dua, Dua which is Arabic and Urdu for a wish to God. So, for me, it's full circle. It's looked like organized Sikhism and organized Islam were talking to each other while they were formatting. And this is completely my subjective opinion, but that's how I interpreted it. That that's what she was imploring us, and she is imploring all of us to think that if they can be so together, when they started giving us virtues, what are, where are we going wrong? Because we clearly are. We cannot ignore the fact that our actions speak so much of the backgrounds we choose to identify. So that was what I thought, and I don't know if now is a good time for us to invite questions from the audiences, or if there are any virtual questions or from all any of your, your thoughts on this. Yes, mm -hmm. Hmm? Who? 
Oh wow, I didn't know that. I amazing. No, we have a wish. Yeah. Oh, for your uh, for that benefit, yeah. Now I just mentioned a very beautiful synchronicity that I was not aware of is that Umaira has a daughter and her name is Dua. I didn't know that, but that's what I was referring to when I did opening the Guru Granth Sahib, which is a holistic scripture. And I'm also referring to any, any scripture that we think is holy for us, but also opening up our hands in a Dua. In a Wait, oh my God, that is very interesting, very interesting. Yeah, I have, I have to speak to Humaira more about that because it turns out I have a daughter also. Um, she absolutely does not act at all like <laughs> anything God would want to, but children. <laughs> sure. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. So to um that's an observation I'll say the Nava is making an observation that how the elements of what we see in in religious practices or how we choose to practice religion, whichever they might be, um ritual performance, repetition. It's also something that is very closely associated with dance. It's very correct, yes. Um, and almost to the to this end of mundane repeatability. So I, I ask that, not that people ask me, but I ask myself that because I consider myself a person who gets intrigued by new things very quickly, very easily. Um, and at the same time, I have chosen, I've gone out of my way. I was trained to be a pharmacist, believe it or not, in my dark past. Like any, <laughs> like any good Asian girl, that's what I um, that's what I did my formal schooling, and that's what brought me to the United States. But I could not, in my good conscience, keep being a pharmacist <laughs> into part of the medical corporate complex. Um, dance is something I never quit doing, and that's when I took that leap of faith. Obviously, that I I want to keep doing this and make it a bigger part of my life. And I wonder, ask that to myself that. How does something that repeats itself so much, something that intrigues you when all you seek is newness and curiosity, and after a while you realize that there is nothing completely original in the world. Every time we make a new movement or a new work, there is no guarantee that this has not done before. And I think even memories transcend time. We are probably retaining, um, I know this sounds very dreamy and philosophical, but I actually believe it. I'm sure there's science to prove it that we, we retain um, shards of memories from our ancestors or from vibrances around us and all the not mind, whatever is personal, and that means that whatever is very personal is universal. And that's why it does not need your consciousness. You have the urge to repeat this over and over. And I feel like even after I have done this for I can execute this more precision. When it gets way too precise, it's looking too mechanical. Can I execute it with a little more languidness? So there's no end to how And then for something new, only to find out it what you have asked yourself before have already been. And also the interesting part of venturing a little bit out of your comfort zone and finding art, accidental messages that speak to you and they speak I would like to ask all of you, is this your first time witnessing this? Is this piece? You've seen it before. And what has it brought to your mind, if I may ask? And just the mundaneness, right? Almost. Like I was talking about repeatability and repetition in dance. That's bigger. Like a water, modern plumbing. We all have that. Um, you wouldn't, that wouldn't be your first thought when you thought of art, sculpture. You sculpt this. 
into wood and this is made of fine wood um, as Humera has told me I um, can't imagine the the precision and the strength it must have taken to carve these out that also really struck me about how symmetrical they are even though they are slightly different it's like this puzzles with it as children you know you have six pictures and you are asked that make out that one difference in one of them so that as you notice as far as my observation goes that's the only difference i see is that the one in the center other four, even the of the figures are the exact same, and uh, that's making me think if that was also very intentional. If she had uh, a thought behind that, of making that one center one look like that, uh, and yeah, that's isn't that amazing? That's something that is so such an everyday object and everyday vessel. It's making us all bring here and <laughs> try to decipher so much into it. And the more we think, the more we realize that we don't know or we want to know more about this. And I almost wonder if that one, just because you mentioned that if this one figure being three quarters is also an allusion to the fact that mostly traditional Mughal art used to be, the subject was three quarters, but the other four figures are looking at you. They're making eye contact. Yes. Yeah, and same for this this vessel. I will have to ask Mayor, and I don't know now if you would know what is um this vessel is called, if there's a term for it, the receiving vessel sort of the container. But there's a very specific word for it. And again in South Asian households, this is again a very everyday common container to pour water. Um now since obvious most of us have access to figures, it's still it has become like a decorational our cultural vintage piece to have this to dispense of water. That's also something that is a very everyday garden. And again, I really admire this and the artist for that and obviously connection because when something is, I see visual arts as something that is very, very, very high minded to a point that it's not up to me to ever fully understand. And I know I come from the arts background, so you would think that, what is she saying? But I'm being very honest. When I see anything visual, I always wonder if, is this meant, is this meant open to interpretation? Is this something, do I even dare interpret it in the way that I would want to? Because it all seems so abstract and so, it almost. Um, again, speaking of Indian sculpture, where we have so many sculptures in our, um, in specifically in Hindu and folk Indian traditions. Of deities, we worship our deities. So again, that's what the immediate connection of sculptures goes to. So you don't question them, not publicly at least, because you are not allowed to. <laughs> and you sculpt this. Suddenly, we all feel like, oh, this is accessible. If she can make figures in a container, I can think about this. I can make meaning out of this, even though the meaning can be multifarious. But this is something now that's mine. He wants it. How are so for me? They're almost performers. Because again, with dance, that's also a discussion, and it's not just a discussion, it's something that's happening, that dancers love the stage and a concert hall, because awesome, everything is acoustically tuned, the lights are placed just so, which makes us look glamorous, it makes a great viewing um, instance for audience. But when we get out of there, of that, sanctum sanctotum, and take ourselves to places like we have danced at Piers, for instance, or uh, on mosaic floors, um, or in children's uh, play areas, and we have gone out of our way to do that, or on memorials that are on the street, for instance, like one that comes to my mind immediately, another great Philadelphia institution is the Irish Memorial, which is not too far from here at Penn's Landing. It's a beautiful giant bronze sculpture, again, a 40 foot sculpture commemorating the um, first year of Irish immigration after the potato famine to the United States. All of this, these are very public places. So that has been of interest about how much I like to dance and we like dance. And when you do that, a very classical Indian dance, which people would otherwise feel that, oh, this is a very niche topic. Is this for me to even watch or interpret? And if I watch, then is it up for me to question or to do it? 
So when you go there and when you dance there, the acoustics are terrible, not present. They are competing with like buses going by, <laughs> people yelling at each other. Because <laughs> it's a public space, you can cordon it off. You're suddenly it's raining while you're dancing in the middle of nowhere. And um, sometimes you have to finish that piece with moderate rain and then go and let the rain and then dry and then take mops. We actually just quickly in our dance costume so we can go back on the stage, not slide off and dance. But it's all worth it. Because you know what that happened, the audience suddenly felt that you are everyday people like us. You're not on a stage for us to just admire. And that brought them closer to us. That brought a very sophisticated, religious, dance style with religions, origins closer to people, more accessible. And the question and answer sessions we had after that and the relationships with when we do those things um, are very precious, one of a kind. So that, that's what I want you guys to take home from this today and many sculptures like this and uh, please if not today tomorrow please us how are hit us on now for an aha moment that comes to you if it's not today then you're welcome to bring that on Yes, I mean men, it's not that men are not allowed to, so men do train just like ballet. I would say the ratio of the gender ratio is very much like ballet, that men do learn the dance. But there is just a much larger proportion of women who actually dance on stage and who continue this heritage. Yes, please. Uh, is that something you're observing or was there more to your question? Well, uh, they do. There are male performers of Bharatanatyam and of other cl uh, classical Indian dance forms. So there always are. Yes. And, and, no. no. And, and gender non-conforming people as well. Um, so men, women and gender non-conforming, yes, they perform. But women make the much larger part of performers. And that's interesting. Interesting is a good way to put it, but it always fascinates me because the conductors and composers of the music that goes with it have always been men. Just like in Western classical music, if I can draw a parallel, that conductors are almost always men. It's not like women are not allowed to, but if you see orchestras big and small today, women will make part of the choir. They'll play different instruments, but the conductor is almost always a male, a pairing male. So. That also speaks a lot about gender roles. <laughs> interesting, interesting parallel there again that, yes, that who gets to conduct the show and how do we, and I, I take responsibility as the person who identifies a woman that we also, since we carry and we hold up half the sky, we are compliant in patriarchy also. Sometimes inadvertently, sometimes because we're forced to, but yes, we are holding up half the there as well but yes that's interesting and yes in Hindi language do we use this as sign language if you say no because it's, 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 there's no finite meaning to anything but it's the other way around that because people from that area of the world gesticulate in this way in their everyday observations like I just did this um, from there is where the dance form codified these and gestures so it's the folk. So again, that's another interesting thing. Yeah. And I like to say, I, I like to believe that again, that classical dances are supposed to be these things that somehow came from nowhere, including ballet, but it, I think the other way around. All dances were folk dances first. Everything comes from people. It doesn't come where, where might it have come from so nicely regimented for us to follow. And we don't have a human source. So why is it that we are not attributing it to that? So it has, it is folks who are making these gestures, it's their languages, and they're taken regimented and then they become classical. And that is also a big point of discussion that who gets to be called classical? Huge, big, wide open subject there. Um, when um, they were asking a question, I thought you had one.
Um, one, one good answer. No, that's true. That's that why more women do it. It has, again, very traditional. It has been seen as something very purely ornamentational. This, this is not how I would dance. You think that I'm dressed up, but this is very simple and pared down. There are like a gazillion ornamental pieces and the costume itself and uh, the jewelry weighs so many pounds. So that process of dressing up has traditionally been affiliated with um, female habits, so to speak. And what I also truly think that the compositions, the poetry was written a lot by men. <laughs> and the poetry, the music, or men who wanted to envision it in a certain way, that how would a woman find her? So when you want to, when you actually want to show that on stage, then you want a woman to act it out. So I mean, it just looks, so most of the traditional themes are, are lending themselves to that, where the, the word, the very specific word we have in dance, which has again Sanskrit and Tamil origins is the Naika. Naika literally means the heroine. And she has, she does a lot of things. She does, she has many moods. She has many expressions, but one underlying thread that goes through all of that is either her yearning for happiness, romantic happiness through a male, looking for the male, describing the beauty of the male, describing so many ways that he's charismatic. So wouldn't make sense if I was a man and um, I'm writing compositions, I will have a woman and I would feel that you are perfect to edit this out. So that's why I feel because you're right, I don't see um, very many reasons why not the, as many men dancing this classical form as women. And one, again, uglier, bitter reality truth is also performing arts. Um, probably not always are monetizable that well. <laughs> and um, in most parts of the world, in most traditional gender roles, the burden of making more money falls on the men. So maybe sometimes it's just not feasible, unfortunately. It breaks my heart to say that because trust me, I also pay my mortgage through money and I need money to being a girl. <laughs> so I wish we all had money. Um, but again, that's, a, that's a, again an issue that we uh, are all navigating and trying to do something with in the performing arts that how do we get compensated enough that more people can actually do this full time as they want to. And I feel that unfortunately, maybe there's a male disadvantage in this. In a rare case, <laughs> I don't even know if this is working, Katie, but it, it just, yeah, it feels like I'm holding my own Oscar, so I might as well. Okay, great. In the piece, it's all about cleansing and washing ends, uh, but the yeah, mom ends are hiding. He's not welcoming you. He's not offering his arm. Mm -hmm. his, his arms are on the back, and on the back you see label, which is like the most, you know, Western uh, sexual. So I'm wondering your response to, like, there is no arm on that. There is no welcoming. Mm -hmm. There is no... Um, but the symbol of seeing it's like Western. In, yeah. In a way, and it's also like not possible of cleansing really, because you have, you cleansing with the water, you cleansing with the vessel. It's, it's, it's like, it doesn't make sense in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I'm wondering your, how do you, like, Oh, that's thank you for and may I you don't have but I wanted to ask your name. You know, I'm sorry. Bon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a very interesting um interpretation. And yes, you are the first thing that comes to that visually is just the fact that the person who's depicted here is closed. Metaphorically, virtually, literally everything that it's only my place to see what you're doing and not the other way around. This is not 
an exchange that's flowing both ways. It's not an exchange at all. He is watching you from a pedestal. That's my immediate um, interpretation of that. That this is supposedly right. He's coming. <laughs> Exactly. I, it struck me again. I I am so bowled over by Humera's directness that it struck me that she didn't just make an allusion to who knows what he's holding. It's very literally Playboy. Like she's not leaving anything to imagination is what I interpret there. And so she's being very very direct about it. That who knows what happens, and we all know that all kind of things happen unfortunately in places of worship. That we would not even think of, or we wouldn't want to think, or our consciousness jitters and shakes when you think of how can this happen anywhere? But for them to actually happen and take place inside places of worship, and that kind of flips the script on their head. That what of all of this then, if things like that are happening inside or outside of it, and that was my thought. And again, I I also smiled and laughed almost to myself, a playboy, because it brought me another reference from India, which is. um this book called kama sutra and uh, i have to be honest is ever since i have been in the united states um almost half my life now it cracks me up that's my like most politically correct that if the reference comes up so often you a coffee table book we don't talk about it we don't read it parents don't should be our next reading assignment it's it's one of the millions of scriptures we have so it's again about the gaze that doesn't interesting right there's not a taboo you would think yeah in the ideal world that's what it would be and i would be so proud to say that if that were true but as a, as a person of indian origin i can tell you that it's anything but open uh, anything about desire sex in every day public discourse and uh, yeah i mean we should take a leaf out of our own kama sutra maybe <laughs> and make it less taboo <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> it's not so yeah that's a very good point that somewhere we need to again it's about looking into your own pasts and your own conscience and not just hold it up as a tourism uh, placket that oh look we have this and we have the carvings of kama sutra in this very famous temples of khajuraho which is i think it's a unesco dedicated site even uh, the carvings on the temples but is it a part does that reflect into our everyday lives and conversations no it's not that conversation is not welcome <laughs> and you also making me again think very interestingly about the opposite of what this person doing holding his hands um class behind him i want to end it by doing something this is very topical and contemporary but it just so happens that one of his biggest movie stars shahrukh khan who happens to be a very moderate and liberal muslim is right now his latest release is be, uh, making and breaking box office records called the movie called pathan it could be more topical yeah i'll i'll send you all of you if you're interested he's a phenomenon in himself <laughs> i don't know how good or bad the movie is probably really really bad if it's so popular <laughs> like all big mass hits but it's interesting that his signature gesture over years he has he has become this unwilling emblem almost of openness of secularism in india and i want to finish with that shahrukh khan signature move he has all these cliched moves we still love him for that yes we have to relate to this this off about that and so you are you are answering a very pertinent pop culture question that you keep asking that what makes shahrukh khan is almost the topic of many sociological studies that why does this how did this person become so darn famous and this is what keeps coming up the open arms as opposed to arms clasped behind your back so i think that sums up everything <laughs>
very topical not coincidental look up pathan i don't recommend the movie but look it up so you know, <laughs> please don't judge me by that but look up sharukh khan and why does he keep coming up as this emblem of love and secularism and understanding and tolerance across ethnicities and religions unfortunately yes yes and i i wish i wish it was only this time and times change yes <laughs> but thank you so much all guys and um thanks for all the great questions and also thank you for bearing with um, scratchy voices i don't even know i'll go home and find out when i see the recording how we all sound in all the different microphones <laughs> Okay great. Thank you.